Hello and welcome to DIY Indie Musicians Talking Music. Today's guest is Brett Newbolt, uh, Mr. Aging Teen Idol. How you doing, Brett? Doing all right. Thanks for having me on, Martin. Oh, it's a, it's a pleasure, man. Thanks for taking the time. No so uh, let's start off. Tell me about the name, Aging Teen Teen Idol. I mean, I, I it's respect that you're using your name. I'm assuming it's not a stage name. No, Brent Newbold is my real name. And the Aging Teen Idol part is kind of funny in a sense. Now, I, I grew up in two places, I like to say, but where a lot of when I started liking music was in the Chicago area. I moved to Southern Illinois, then moved back from Southern Illinois back to the Chicago area. And there used to be a DJ uh, called Alan Stagg. He okay. used to do a, a radio show called Sanctuary where they played old psychedelic rock and that kind of thing. And he would uh, introduce himself as, um, he would say, you know, Alan Stagg, Gaging Teen Idol. It was kind of like a joke. It was oh, kind of like yeah. a joke there. You know, it was kind of like, I was kind of like, hmm, you know, Fast forward 35, 40 years, <laughs> I, jokingly, I, I, go, I go to a workout place and my coach at the workout place um, was really into classic rock, psychedelia, that kind of thing. So just out of nowhere, instead of having my name, Brent Newbold, come up on the board, you could have it anything you want. So I went, put Aging Teen Idol because it had been part of my email and I always just thought it was like a really cool moniker. Yeah. So, you know, I'm kind of, you know, I kind of throw it there. They, they, they've been calling me that now forever. And when he saw that, he goes, Aging Teen Idol. Who the hell's Aging Teen Idol? <laughs> and she basically raised my hand. He goes, that's the best name I've ever seen. I'm calling you Idol from here on in. So it's been a going thing now for about four years or so. But that, that's kind of where it comes from. And now we have a core group of friends and they all call me Idol. So it's just how that goes. So that's that's kind of how that came about. Yeah, you'll just just have to watch out if you run into Billy Idol. Right. Well, it's, might... a, it's a lot different. I don't think he would like to call himself an aging teen idol. But that but that's all right. Well, I mean, he's definitely aging and he was definitely a teen idol. If you oh, well, yeah, you're probably old that. enough to remember when uh when, when he was at his height. And he was very popular with the ladies. Oh, yeah, yeah. And even before that with Generation X. I mean, yeah. True enough. Yeah. I mean, so, I mean, yeah. he had been in the business. And that's sort of the reason why I did, like, if you if you see me on Spotify or anything like that, I'm Brent Newbold. The Aging, T I named the second album Aging Teen Idol, but you can name an album anything you want. So, yeah, <laughs> I yeah. Went, I went ahead and do that. So, it's kind of like... Kind of like a nickname that's not really an official trademark, but I kind of have it on my, I've had it on my email for 15, 20 years now. So it's kind of like one of those things. So. And you have plausible deniability if you ever do run into them. Yeah, sure. It's like, <laughs> do you call yourself the aging teen idol? <laughs> really? Although yeah. he, seems, he seems like he's a nice guy. Oh yeah. I don't yeah. think you would have a problem either way. No, no. And, and I don't think it's his real name either. No. Like it might be a made up name, just just so. possibly. We, we we're not sure though. So um, thanks for sending me your uh, pre release copy of your new single, which is about to come out. You said June first, is that correct? June first, yep. Yeah. Um, and uh, it's "I Need You" by the Kinks. It's a cover, right? It is a cover song. Typically, what, what possession? It sounds great. Uh, you really, I think you really captured that sort of 60s spirit and especially of the Kinks, who for me were one of the most, or they probably get the least respect of all the great 60s bands. I, I would And, and I, I don't understand why, because they literally, they wrote so many classic songs that are so memorable and so, I don't know, like who level of, of an, you know, anthemic. Why do you think it is? You have any idea? Well, I don't know. I mean, they 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 have the dynamic that a lot of bands. I mean, if you look at Oasis with the two brothers constantly fighting, I mean, the Davies brothers were constantly at it. I mean, yeah. they were. I I would like to. I would probably say that they were probably one of the first punk-ish bands. <laughs> I mean, no doubt. You know, I mean, you can trace things back to you. You know, you really got me and yeah. Van Halen of all things. Right off the top of my head, I can think of two covers, two covers that they did that were kink songs. One of which was probably their big break in America. So yeah. But I don't I I just don't get it. Maybe it's because 
they really didn't hold on to a genre, I guess. I mean, because if you look at the Village Green uh, Preservation Society, that is nothing like what they had done earlier. A great yeah. record, though. So hats off yeah. to them for constantly evolving and mm -hmm. being artists instead of, you know, yeah. I mean, I love ACDC, but you've heard ACDC and you've heard ACDC and then you've heard ACDC. Yeah. And then they had a singer change and you're still hearing ACDC, ACDC. you know. Yeah. Hats off to them for having a formula that works for them. That's great. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. The, the only thing that I can think of is especially with a record like the Village Preservation Society, I think they they embraced too much Englishness for an American audience to really understand. And I think that that might have had something to do with it. Sure. You know, compared to, you know what I mean? It wasn't the sort of mods versus rockers, which was the whole who thing. Right. right, which is a lot more understandable. Sure. Uh, although I think most of the Americans probably identified with the rockers more. <laughs> anyway, well, that's yeah, a I mean, story, right? Well, it comes. I mean, but, but, but look at what had already just broke. I mean, you had the Beatles and you had the yeah. Rolling Stones, so yeah. you have these you have these squeaky clean guys that are doing these nice sing songy songs, and then mm -hmm. you have these bad boys over here that are you know, doing that, and then so and then here comes the Kinks. Yeah. And then you have Herman's Hermits. I mean, where do they fit? <laughs> yeah, no, like, it's uh, and I, I don't think they ever they were never really that successful in the United States. I think they really had right. you got me. Was there anything else that was a big hit there that you can think of? Well, uh, Lola. Lola, of course. But that was that was years later and nothing yeah. like what they had released before. I mean, yeah, I mean, but. Great songwriter. Ray Davies was a great songwriter. I mean, one of the best. Very, very, yeah. very solid. But yeah. what's what's funny about um, "I Need You" is that is a song that actually slipped through the cracks. I it wasn't on my radar, and I ended up getting a compilation of old garage rock. I like old garage rock, psychedelic yeah. type stuff. And there was a group called the Rationals mm -hmm. that did "I Need You," and I heard that I'm like. What the devil is this? <laughs> you know, so any I'm doing yard work or whatever. I'm like, I need you. Dun, 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 dun. I'm like, yeah. So I figured, you know, getting back into the routine of recording because I've been off of recording for a while. Right. I, ha I had that on my skull. So I plugged it in. Uh, hour and a half later, that popped out. So I was like, well, yeah. so. Yeah. No, it's it's interesting because I didn't recognize, I'll be honest, I didn't recognize the title. I knew we, we, we'd we spoken and you'd said it's a kink song. And then you put it on that chorus hit and it's like, oh, I've heard this before. I like this. This is a really good song. And it is. It, it's, it's, it's unbelievably catchy. But a lot of the kink stuff was, right? It was very simple, very, you know, three chords, but they oh, yeah. chose really, really good chords. You know, all the day and all the night. I mean, you all, yeah, probably, they, they just you but, probably take those two songs and put them together and then go into, you know, you 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 really got me. And yeah. you would see very similar uh, song structure, very similar chords. And you could put them together without, a, you know, someone will probably do a mashup of them at some point. It's not a bad idea. Let me write that. Down. Future recording. <laughs> I'll write that down. Yeah. So, so, so listen. You you said you took a break from uh, doing music. Uh, why was that? Um, I got to a point after I put out the Aging Teen Idol album that I I couldn't really think of anything else to do. To be truthful, I mean, I would sit, I, I would constantly play and everything, and then I got into the whole "Do I want to be in a band?" thing. You know, right. am I good enough to be in a band thing? How long has it, you know, it's been? Because I, you know, I did the whole band thing in the late 80s and the early 90s through all of that. And then ended up, you know, going to school and moving and, you know, adulting, all of that good stuff. But music has always been there. Mm -hmm. um, it just got to the point where I would have my DAW full of stuff, but nothing that I really wanted to take the time to put together. And then I just decided I got to get it started again. Okay. So that's kind of, you know, it was more frustration than anything, truly. So right about this time, two years ago, is when the, the second album came out. Then I released three singles, and that was a whole nother thing. Singles, that's that's just a thing that yeah. I'm not used to that, I think, in terms of albums. I'm older, and I think of terms yeah. of, 
what is the what are these suite of suites of the suite of songs what story is it telling you know because you know i used to listen to the wall yeah way back when you know and double album <laughs> you know i had it on a long play cassette one of the first cassettes i ever bought and that that was what i would do mm -hmm. so that's the way that i think so if i don't have a good 12 15 songs that i don't feel are unified that stumps me because i don't know what to do with them so there sit however many songs that i've been working on okay and so with the uh with the single is it just a single or are there other tracks released with it because I know well, that I, I've released singles and it can be up to three songs, I think it is, or two or three. No, this is just a single song. The, okay. the last three that I've done um, were just single songs. Okay. And the way that Spotify releases things just kind of baffles me because you have to release a single or one song off, and you can't keep releasing singles off of that release. No, I know. Which is so, a little bit of a pain in the... Anyway. Right. Well, because they're not thinking in terms of albums, they're no. thinking in terms of streaming one song. So, well, playlist more more than that, I think. But yeah, right. Uh, it's it's the, the mixtape thing, right? Right. So that's that's one of the reasons why. Because you know, I like all I like anything that I record. I like, and I'd love to put it out as singles. But then, then all you really have to do, honestly, is just promote one song, and you've got your single. <laughs> So, yeah, it's it's what it's what I'm doing. It's just uh, like I've I've got a record is, that's going to be coming out sometime in the summer. I think I'm not sure exactly when. Cool. And and I'm I'm but I I'm almost trying to figure out how to do it because I think there is a way technically of actually releasing a single beforehand because a couple of the songs from the album are pretty well done, right. and then re-releasing it on the album. So I've got to go. I've got to go and look at because I think there might be a way of doing that, which is sort of a way of getting around it, you know. Sure. Because what 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 what's nice about that is that you you're not taking so much time between releases, basically, right? And you get to showcase a single, right? Because as you know, I mean, in a lot of cases, songs get done, and once they're done, you don't really mess around with, or at least I I don't mess around with them much as I'm finishing the rest of the album. I'm not doing, you know, 10 songs at the same time. You know what I mean? Except maybe right. at the end, you might do a little bit of that when you get to the mastering stage, let's say, or the, you know, the end of the mixing. Well, that's how I had done it. The last yeah. two full releases is I would, I would work on, I would get most of it completed and then go back and do little tweaks. And yeah. if I didn't like something or lyrics didn't match up to what was going on, then I would do all that. But then I would, Go through the mastering process, go, you know, mixing, make sure that everything sounds basically the same, and then I would yes. run everything through the mastering mm -hmm. program that I have. So that's that's how I would operate that. Yeah. But this doing one song though, it's like okay, I can do this in two days if I really really wanted to, and and then mix for four weeks, and then <laughs> master, master for two months, <laughs> and then yeah, you know the big headache that that is, you know. But that's well, although although I have to say, uh, I think it was John uh, John Mickey who who turned me on to it. I, I invested and bought like the whole Isotope suite one time when it was on sale, and that that just makes it a lot easier. Right, and he actually gave me that exact same advice. He's like, "Go buy a Mac Mini, get Isotope, and get this interface to plug in." Because to be truthful, this is it. Yeah. <laughs> this is what I've been working on. To be truthful, you know, this and my uh, my Pod 500. Um, it's a it's a Pod HD 500X, and that does all my processing. Yeah. So. But yeah, no, I, I just I, I I I before I ended up getting it, I had so many headaches with the mastering, and it's just like you're hitting your head against the wall trying to figure out why does my stuff, you know, it sounds great on headphones. And, you know, why does it sound when you compare it to anything else? Like it's been recorded in like a garbage can or what, whatever. And it's or you, you go from your headphones to the car, you go from the car yeah. to the phone, you go. And then it's it's not it doesn't sound unified. Yeah, that's the biggest headache in the world. And I'm hoping down the road once I upgrade the way I do things, it'll be that. But but hopefully, hopefully everything is sounding sounding all right and pretty decent. I mean, I've worked 
fairly decently hard to try to get it to sound as good as I possibly can. No, it, it definitely, I was going through your sort of all of your releases on Spotify before, before our chat. Um, and uh, definitely it sounds really good. You've got a very nice, very eighties, very uh, sort of hard rock sound, I'd say. Yeah. I, I noticed the occasional sort of rush influences coming in and out once in a while. It seems, oh, yeah. seems to be a pretty and uh and and it you know it sounds 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 excellent. Um but uh what was I gonna say? Um oh actually that that's a, a good aside while I try to remember the other thing that just slipped my mind. Do you play all of the stuff on your own or uh do you, do you have collaborators? Um, that's one of the moment. things that I, I actually have in my bio somewhere is that I do my own stunts. So yeah, I do I do play all of the instruments and I'm not the best piano player in the world. There's okay. some piano music here and there. So um, I have a left right brain disconnect even when it comes to playing guitar. Mm -hmm. um, so watching Eddie Van Halen and other people that were yeah. doing the tapping and doing, you know, you know, things. Yeah. I'll bring a hand over, I'll pick one note, and I'm, I'm hammering and pulling the rest of them. But playing piano, I will do all my right-hand stuff, then I'll do another track with all left-hand stuff. So it, I try to get out of, I try to get out of doing programming as much as I humanly can. You know, uh, for one of the albums, I had an electronic drum set, and that just got really, really, really tedious. Yeah. So I actually stopped that and just started programming the drums. Yeah, and and I guess the guitars. While you're playing guitars, piano, you're just playing it through MIDI from your um, keyboard or uh... a keyboard straight into my my pod, straight into the phone. <laughs> yeah, even better. Yeah, that's yeah. I, I I I've worked like that too. Well, actually, it was like from my iPad directly into the the DAW. You know, from, from the uh, mic out. <laughs> yep, and I, I run that right into GarageBand. That's exactly how I do it too. Yeah, no, it's it's uh yeah. I, I, well, actually, I'm I, I'm using. I ended up discovering Reaper. I've heard Never Reaper's really though. good. If you're if you're looking for a bit of an upgrade from uh, from GarageBand. Uh, Reaper is for the. I think it. I mean, basically, you can get a free demo that doesn't expire. But okay. they but they ask you know you make a donation of I think it's sixty bucks for a lifetime license, and they literally are updating it twice a week. Well, that's pretty cool. So at that point, I just thought you know what I'm going to give them the sixty bucks because they deserve it. No, no, seriously, you know right, what I mean. Sure. But but it's basically it's full everything. Never had a problem, and it's what's nice, and you'd love it. It's right down your alley is it's so small the actual app that runs everything uh that you can run it from a thumb drive wow so you could have literally have it on a thumb drive and then you know I mean, as long as the files were on the computer and you could just plug it in and run it from that so that's pretty cool stuff. pretty cool it, it's yeah. it's not bloatware like a lot of them it's you know a lot of the bigger systems and it's 60 bucks to have basically professional level stuff, which is pretty crazy. You know? Cool. So I would, I would recommend that if you're looking for an upgrade at some point, although I don't know if it's going to run in your little pad. I okay. Good, those. good, good. I <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's always good. See, that's what I like about talking with other musicians because you, you learn how, you know, you, you, you hear things that you haven't done before, or you're using products that you haven't yeah. used before. And I put down those ideas. Yeah. Anytime that, you know, like in our chat groups, yeah. that someone comes up with an idea, I'm like, okay, I can yeah. try that. You know, I'm constantly. No, well, see, see, what's really nice with Reaper, and it's something that you might enjoy, is that you get then access to all of those VST plugins, right? Because I don't know if you can, if you can do much of that with GarageBand. And no, as an example, really. like uh, Reaper, there's a whole community of reaper heads right like people that are really into into using it and uh there's a package a free package of downloads and and literally i i don't think i've i've spent 
outside, really outside of getting the whole isotope stuff, which is fantastic. I don't really think I've spent more than like ten, fifteen dollars on plugins because there's so much fantastic free stuff out there. That's awesome. And then and then it just all runs through Reaper. You know what I mean? You 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 get you download this major package and you've got all of your standard effects things and then you can there's always downloads and stuff you can find right for like virtual instruments and stuff like that and then it's all midi through your keyboard right you know and right. then steve slate drums which are pretty pretty fantastic too like full drum kits and stuff and all these like all these things are free basically, because they always got, they've got demo versions and stuff like that. And if you're like me, I mean, I'm going to be putting effects on a drum, no matter how it's sourced, <laughs> you know, sure. you know, so I don't necessarily need to have 35 different choices of, of the drum sound, you know what I mean? Sample from, you know sure. what I mean? From a, a super perfect setup, because I know I'm going to put stuff onto it anyway. And I have a habit of finding one that I like, and I will ride that until it's dead. So <laughs> exactly, and and that's the point that I'd forgotten earlier is that you've got a very distinct sound with your guitar. <laughs> it's a very yeah. recognizable sound. Yeah, there's... Uh, with, with that lead guitar. <laughs> yeah, the way yeah, that's I I have I have a couple of patches that I've designed. Uh, so no matter what I play it through, as long as it's a decently clean channel, maybe with a little bit of overdrive, mm -hmm. it's going to sound consistent. And that was yeah. one of the things, that's one of the things that I learned from the guitarists of the eighties or the late seventies, even, I mean, Eddie Van Halen, you're going to hear Eddie Van Halen, no matter what he's doing, Randy Rhodes, big influence on mine. He's the guy that really, he, Ace Freely, and Yngwie Malmsteen were the guys that made mm -hmm. me want to play, you know, so, but each one of them, very distinct sound. And yeah. that's what I was going for. And I'm, yeah. I'm thank thank you for saying that. No, you, 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 it was, it's it's noticeable, you know, especially as as in my case today, going sort of going through it through the and listening to everything on on Spotify one after the other. It's like, oh yeah, after about three or four tracks, wow, that guitar sound, <laughs> you know, it's it's noticed. Yeah. No, it's good. So uh, you mentioned some of your influences. What 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 would you say are your your top three influences musically? Oh, musically. Well, it could well, be anything, but, you know, we're, oh, we're, yeah. we're talking I mean, about music, so. I mean, well, my very first album that I bought was <laughs> right here. <laughs> and, you know, and if you're going to start off on an album, start on a live album. I'll tell you what, because <laughs> I'll tell you what, that's the first album that I bought. Yeah. And everything, everything goes back to this album, honestly, you know, King of the Nighttime World, you know, Tomorrow and Tonight and, you know, shout it out loud in those songs. You know, you'll you'll hear elements of, of those pretty much um, throughout what I do, sort of, in a sense. I mean, it doesn't sound like it, but that's kind of like song structure. You know, mm -hmm. call and answer and that kind of thing. That, that's yeah. that's really what Tad tattooed it on my chromosomes. So, <laughs> you know, that. And you, you mentioned earlier that you heard Rush elements. Well, yeah, I mean, I remember being a little guy and my my neighbor going, we need to listen to this. And it was 2112. So, I'm like, you know, that just completely blew me away. And, you know, you're figuring yeah. this is, you know, 76, 77, 78. So I'm all of four five and six years old, very impressionable. And I'm like, well, this is the way music is supposed to sound. Yeah. You yeah. Know? No, no, de definitely. And, and that was at the time, 2112. Well, that was their big breakthrough record. Right. Uh, you know, they, they, they were, they, they'd been pop popular around Toronto, I think before then. Sure. And, and they were one of those bands that was doing, you know, they were doing the, all the high school events. And then after that, they weren't doing high schools anymore. Well, no. And then, <laughs> you know? and then you know, moving pictures comes out and, bah! you know, yeah, and all of that. So, yeah, th those those were very, very big influences. Um, my aunt, honestly, was a big influence on me. She was a church pianist, but she was also the music teacher at our school. Oh, okay. So from third grade, you know, I moved back to Southern Illinois in third grade. She was a teacher in that school. And she goes, okay, you're playing cornet. Okay. <laughs> you can already play the hand drum. You're playing cornet. So I played 
uh, cornet for two years. Okay, you're moving to baritone. Okay, you're moving to trombone. Okay, Brent, go play the clarinet part. Okay. <laughs> You know, so it's kind of one of those things, you know, so she was a, a discipline and listening and be, yeah. being able to pick out what doesn't work and what does has everything to do with how she trained me. Yeah, no, it's great. And and have you have you uh, had had an opportunity to go back and pick up the clarinet or the trombone again? Um, I can get a scale out of it. <laughs> You know, if I try really hard, um, there's 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 a clarinet here in the house, and yeah. I don't think I'd be able to make heads or tails of it. I think I could maybe go up and maybe go down, but that would be it. I still have the cornet here, but I can't hit above a G on it anymore. My lips are are so messed up. Yeah, it's it's. Uh, I think that's one of the problems with it, huh? Is you you really have to you have to have the whole thing yeah. with the you know with your your mouth and especially your your lips. I think are really crucial with all that. Which is too, which is too bad because it's like, I'm a big fan of uh, of Roxy music, and one of the things I loved about Roxy music was Andy McKay, and he just brought like so much to the band in the sense that they got this guy he plays he plays the clarinet, he plays the oboe, what a fantastic you know what I mean, fantastic right. instrument, saxophone, and and it added this element to them whether or not he was just like riffing lines or doing solos that most bands, rock bands just didn't have, you know? Right. And, and that kind of thing, I mean, that, that goes back to the very end of the Brian Jones era of the Rolling Stones as yeah. well. I mean, because Brian Jones was a multi-instrumentalist and you, you hear an oboe, you know, uh, on Dandelion, you know, and that's, you know, pretty, yeah. you know, pretty obscure stuff for Stones fans, but you know, yeah. But what a fantastic yeah. instrument! Oh, you yeah, know? And, and a really good rock instrument too. You know, right. when it's when it's like properly amplified. Um, yeah, it's it's. Uh, I mean that that's one thing that I'll, I'll I have to say that I'm a little bit. Uh, I, I feel I feel sorry for this generation of music, in in that no, but in that there this yeah. sense of experimentation. That probably started with the Beatles. I mean, a lot of it was coming in through that originally, and then it sort of took off from there. Is is sort of lacking now, and and you just you don't really hear, you know, the, these instruments that they you know that that make a song, you right. know, and, and it isn't just these these terrible sort of eighties endless saxophone solos or anything like that. But, you know, they think of like, again, with Roxy Music, a song like uh, Love is the Drug, those horns, you know yeah. what I mean? But oh, yeah. they make the song and, and the song, it's like, you, I can still hear them in my head, you know, because they, but they, and, and it just adds this whole thing to it, right? Right. You okay. would not get from a synthesized line, a synthesizer line or guitars or whatever. It's just, you know. Right. I mean, Brass sections in general, or having different instrumentation. I mean, listen to "Make Me Smile" from Chicago sometime, and you could you could do a whole show yeah. on just the different parts and how how intricate that song is from every single member of that band. A lot yeah. of people think of when they hear Chicago, they think our love was meant to be. Well, that's not all they did. You know? Well, I mean, it's very little of what they did until about the third or the fourth record, too, right? Right. Well, I mean, those, after, those early records were crazy. I, 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 I saw a document. I love watching rock documentaries. Right. You know, and YouTube is just this great. There's an unending supply of them if you look around. Right. And I saw a great one on Chicago and I had no idea about how sort of radical that band was. Oh, when, it, yeah. when it was first like developing and they developed that whole style. And then what was the other band that, that started like right before them and stole a lot of the thunder? Oh, was it called? It was like, Oh, it was this other musician who heard them said, this is going to be big. And he, he went back and he put together a, a like a studio band. Oh, what were they called? Oh, did they do the song spinning wheel? Yeah. Okay. I think it's that. Yeah, I'm just I'm trying to think of their name. I'm still bad with name. But, 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 but again, it was so crazy because it was like again one of these situations like uh, like like with Captain Beefheart, 
I don't know if you oh. know the story of that first record, right? But you get this this band. They're all living basically well under the poverty, uh, you know, well in poverty in this ha this house they've rented, eating one meal a day, practicing 12 hours a day. And then, you know, they get out of that and they start gigging and no one's ever heard anything as good because they're so tight, right? Because they've spent so much time working on it and it's completely right. revolutionary because no one had done that kind of thing with horns and that, that big sound that they had. But it was also, it was like an aggressive Rocky sound too. You oh, know what sure. I mean? It, and then it big and then, yeah. Yeah, and Zappa's another... another Zappa was another wild. Zappa was yeah. Captain Beefheart, right? You know, and he was, and, you know, yeah. that, but, you know, he was a composer to begin with. I mean, he yeah. would have sweet for bicycle, for heaven's sakes. You know? <laughs> no, I know. <laughs> you know, but, but, you know, practicing that much and making sure that everything is hammered down. I mean, it's the same thing that Leonard Skinner did. They were in a hut in the heat for a long time, just outside Jacksonville. And they made sure that they had their craft home because they knew that the only way that they were going to make any money really was going and out and playing. Yeah. You know, but they ended up, you know, well, that's a tragic story too. But yeah, they they had their niche and they they held on to it, you know. Yeah, and they but they spent years and years honing their craft. Oh, geez, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and the other one like that, I'm just trying to think because uh, it, there, there's that sort of whole Muscle Shoals connection with with them, but also with uh, Bob Seger, right? Another one I didn't know. Another great unsung songwriter. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, but but both of those worked with the mus muscle shoal, huh? Very closely. So the swampers, yeah, yeah, the swampers. It's very, you know, it, it's really interesting. Well, there's a really good documentary on on the shoals. If you want yeah. to see the people that were in and out of there, Wilson Pickett, you know, you know <laughs> no, I know, and then and then the Rolling Stones, and then the, oh, yeah. the, the two different studios, and half the people went to the one that they thought was Muscle Shoals, and it was the old one, and. You know. <laughs> Right. But but there's a few of those. I mean, some of those old ones, like the other one is is like uh stacks. Oh and yeah. the bands that came in and out of stacks as well. You know. Right. Oh yeah. Just unbelievable. Yeah, uh, but that's that but that's another thing, you know, another another big influence. I mean, um Steve Cropper. Yep. Great guitar player, very, very um, I think he's underrated, completely underrated. As many hit songs that he's been on, as many things, you know, Sam and Dave. I mean, come on, really? No. <laughs> so, yeah, it's a, but, but I mean, listen, they, 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 if anything, probably were the most blessed because they got to play the music that they, they led, lived really nice lives. Uh, musicians really appreciate them. You know what I mean? They're musicians, musicians. Right. And they got to lead normal lives. You know what I mean? They they lived yeah. in their hometown. They had families. You know, they they didn't have that crazy rock star existence right. that destroyed most of them. There's very few that you know survived into their dotage. And when you look at some of them too, you have to start wondering, you know, just how 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 much is together, right? I well, mean, you know, the only the only listen, the only one who sort of aged gracefully was Bowie. Oh yeah. Um, the right. others, they're all looking a little, I don't know. Well, I mean, yeah, that's that's very true. I mean, I guess Iggy Pop is still out there somewhere, shirtless and running uh, Iggy, Yes, Iggy is, is, but Iggy is his own thing. Sure. Uh, <laughs> well, I, listen, true. I saw Iggy about, geez, now it's even, it's probably about 15, 20 years ago. Uh, and he was in his early 60s at that point. Right with with his band, yeah. I think all of his band were like nineteen, <laughs> and and he was there at sixty, and he was more ripped than they were. Well, when you when you make a career from uh, <laughs> being being shirtless and being a spectacle, I mean that's the thing. But also yeah, but, but he kept it. I mean, the discipline that that man has, yes. right, to stay in that kind of shape in his sixties is. Kudos is oh, all I have to say. Hundred percent, because I'm. It was a great show too. I mean, he's you know Iggy is Iggy, right? He's he's a one a one of a kind. He's a real and, one and it's it's so it's so lucky that Bowie was such a big fan of his, 
Right. Because I think that's really what saved his career. Almost definitely. Most definitely. You know? they, they spent a lot of time in Berlin, from what I understand. And Yeah, but but I mean, even before then, you know, he was, you know, when the Stooges fell apart, right? Uh, and he was sort of, he was homeless and a junkie when when Bowie pulled him in and, and did that, his first solo record, right? Right. You know, he didn't have a record contract. He didn't have anything at that moment. But Bowie, who believed in him, you know? Right. And he was able to revitalize. And then he did that bit, brick by brick album, what, like almost 10 years after that even. Yeah. You know, yeah. That, you know, he got a whole new group of followers that have carried, you know, through the 90s and, and to today. Yeah. No, he, he reinvented himself two, three times. Sure. He's like the the other one who's like that, that absolutely shocked me, maybe even more extreme was Gary Newman. Did you know that Gary Newman has a second career? Did not. <laughs> yeah. Well, a couple of years ago, I get a call from a friend, uh, has, you know, two tickets, can't go to the show. Do you want the tickets? And who is it? Oh, it's Gary Newman. And I, 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 I love Gary Newman. I'm a, you know, I'm a child of the eighties, right? That was for me, the big musical period. So of course I loved it. You know, like that, the first, that first Gary Newman, our friends electric. Wow. That's a great record. Right. So I go sort of expecting to see that. And he played a few of the hits, but he had a second major career doing like industrial goth stuff. Huh? <laughs> yeah. Huh. <laughs> And all the kids who were like everyone who was at the show, but me, they were there for that stuff. They weren't that there for the '80s stuff, right? That's awesome. I know. It, I was just like I was floored, and it seemed, you know, it's good, but it was definitely that sort of industrial, right. heavy duty, you know, sort of Nine Inch Nails type stuff. Yeah, it was fun. Throw, throwing down a little front two four two there. That's awesome. No, yeah. I get that. But uh, anyway, so so let me think. So Kiss 2 was your first record. Yeah. Um, which is an interesting choice because, I, I mean, I was also a Kiss fan, but I think I'm a little bit older than you. So I, I, I like the first live record. <laughs> that was the big one for me. Well, I think that was the, that was the album that broke them, right? Right. It was. Kiss Alive, right? The, the... Kiss, Kiss Alive and then, you know, followed up by Destroyer. I mean, and then like... followed up by Destroyer, produced by Bob Ezrin. Yes. And I can remember that was one of the first records I bought. It was like in sort of high school days, I was a, a Kiss fan. And they weren't popular. That's what a lot of people have to realize. They were not well looked looked upon by a lot of people right. know, at the time. Because, of course, this was in the era of, of sort of Emerson, Lake and Palmer and right. you know, a lot of the prog stuff. So they, oh, yeah. they were, the, yeah, they, they weren't, they weren't a critic's choice. <laughs> no, I mean, put they, it that way. I mean, they looked like a comic book. They looked like a cartoon, you know, no one really yeah. took them seriously. I mean, their, their first three albums tanked. Yeah. And, and let's face it. The first three albums, I own them all. They weren't all that good. In no, retrospect. I think you probably see dress to kill somewhere about right there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 no, actually, I can see it. They, they weren't, but they were, they had their moment. Right. It was a little bit like the, the beginning of, uh, of Queen, although Queen was probably a little bit stronger with their first three records. Sure. Yeah. But they I, also hadn't had a hit, right? Right. I really did like Queen. Um, it was putting on what, like, I think I had a uh, night at the opera and I didn't get it. Yeah, because music was supposed to sound like that, <laughs> and I and I didn't get it. So um, I actually had a babysitter one time that brought the Ramones' second album, Leave Home, brought that over, and I popped that on and went, "That's it, that's it." <laughs> so I really, yeah. really liked I really liked that as well, and that's that's pretty much what carried me into the '80s. And then uh, when I mean, I'd heard Black Sabbath, I had heard of Black Sabbath, I really didn't hear a lot of Black Sabbath. But when Ozzy's two albums came out and I heard Randy Rhodes, that was it. Absolutely for me. Yeah. Yeah. Ozzy was, he was absolutely blessed with his guitarists. Huh? Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, what, what, what a replacement. <laughs> you know, it's like, what a replacement for the original. Yeah. You, you uh, know, the, yeah. Mr. Riff, yeah, Mr. Riff Master 101, right? 
Yeah, you, uh, a classically trained guitar player playing metal. I mean, wow. Well, you yeah. know, and you know, but then when Quiet Riot came out, they're like, we're all kind of like, wait a minute, wasn't that Randy Rhodes' band? They're riding his coattails, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but it was kind of like that. I didn't want to poke at Kevin DeBro there, but he would, you know, that's kind of how that goes. Yeah. So, so there's obviously as well in terms of your guitar guitarist sort of influences, you tend to go for the more classically minded, because if, if it's if it's Randy Rhodes and and then uh, Igmar, whatever his name is, Uge Malmsteen, yeah, yes, uh, who, who I've I've only heard of from from my interest in documentaries, sure. <laughs> you know, but but he was he was also major like a, a major influence on and all of the sort of new metal huh? almost definitely i mean yeah when, it's almost when, like the, the jeff beck of it well yeah and beck is another one from the the previous era that we were talking about that you know he just kind of went off on his little avant-garde little thing but still a blues based guitar player yeah. but i mean you know part of the big three that came out of the yardbirds which you know Thank you. Yeah, Yard. There's three good. There's three guitarists in one band. Huh? <laughs> well, especially when when like the the period I would have loved to have seen them live was when uh, when when Jimmy Page and Jeff Beck were playing together. Right. They were, yeah. At the same time, yeah. I don't think that lasted very long. But boy, would that have been interesting. Yeah. Well, but but what's interesting was also they'd wanted to do it for a while. So it wasn't like right. a management thing or whatever. It was actually they 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 had thought, wow, that'd be cool, and uh, that's what they did. But I mean, Jimmy Jimmy Page wanted to do his band, right? You right. know, and he'd already planned. And I think you know, he'd I, I think he was he I think he was he went back as a favor because he he didn't need to do it at that point because yeah, right. he was the the biggest you know, session player in England at that moment. Yes, he was. I mean, there's no telling yeah. how many recordings he is on that we yeah. don't even know about. <laughs> you know? Yeah, no, well, he's, he's on the level of, you know, some of the the sort of uh, the players from Muscle Shoals and, uh, and, and also the guys, the Demolition Squad or whatever they were called. Yeah, the them. Motown. Yeah. Yeah. But the, the ones out at, uh, out at uh, the Capitol building in, in Hollywood. Yeah. Yeah, in Hollywood, and then the guy had the guys at Motown. You had the the Stacked yeah. Band. Yeah. Sun Records had their own band. I mean, I yeah. mean, that was just the way that recording studios did it. You come in with your song, okay? Here's the guys that are playing your music. What? <laughs> well, you know, okay. you know who else is? You know who else you can probably hear on some Motown records? This one might might blow your mind. You know who Motown signed? Underage. Who? Neil Young. Really. Now, you know, I did know that um, he and Rick James were actually in, they a, were band. in a band and together wasn't and that wasn't band got signed. Right. And that was they're called was the Mocking Jays, I think. I think they're called the Mocking Jays, something like that. OK. And OK. So I know that I knew that he and Rick James had been in a band together. Yeah. Well, Rick James was AOL from the army. And he was in Canada, right? sort of a draft dodger type thing, but I think he actually had, you know, gone AOL from the army. And that's when he met up with Neil Young and they were in the that band together. Then they got signed by Motown. <laughs> think about this, that's right? Awesome. Go to Detroit. And at some time, I think they figured out, like it was either the army who found Rick James or they figured out that um, Neil Young was like, 17 and know that contract he signed wasn't legal <laughs> you know? or so he was like one of these type of things That's and that was sort of the end of it they, they weren't there for very long wow but yeah crazy That's but but cool. that that as well like like that combination rick james and and neil young can you imagine if they actually had a couple of hits and stayed together that would have been something I, oh I yeah would, no the, the music would have been here. really something I would love to hear what that would what that would produce. That would be awesome. Yeah, yeah. There's also the the somewhere it's kicking around somewhere on YouTube. Uh, I saw it. There's a documentary. I'm just. I think it's a. I don't know if it's a Neil Young or a Rick James. I think it might be a Rick James documentary. Or no, it's that that series, uh, the Mike Judge series that he did. Uh, what's what's it called? Uh, 
back of the tour bus or the tour bus or, or something. Have you, have you seen those? I have not. Okay, well, you should check it out. He did this whole series and they're all animated yeah. in his style. It's but it's it's called the something tour bus. I, I can't think of the exact words. Well, Mike Judge. Okay. Yeah, but just Mike Judge. And it's in sort of his cartoon style. And it's all of these war stories from bands, right? That's awesome. And he was no, but it's even better. He was totally into like Motown R and B stuff and then funk. And so he's got some incredible stories of like the J James Brown's bands, uh, you know, the, the, the guys that then became Funkadelic who were, that was one of James Brown's bands, right? They oh, yeah. got fired and, and, and just, and, and, and then country music. And, but, but both of those, I mean, absolutely insane stories. Right. About about wow. these guys, you know, like there's another one. It's absolutely great. It's what is it? What was it? Uh, the killer. Um, piano player, uh, Jerry Lee Lewis. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. And there's a story of him. He's he's in his Cadillac. Right. In Nashville, I guess, in the six, you know, early 60s or whatever. Um at the corner waiting as a pedestrian goes by the pedestrian who goes by is Liberace. <laughs> right? Why is this and, and the, a scene from Pulp Fiction? Oh, because it is a scene. I, I think that's probably, the, I, I think the scene from Pulp Fiction, they stole it from this thing, from this story. Oh, that's right? awesome. And, and the guy that was with him had to stop him from, from, you know, slamming on the gas and running him over. <laughs> <laughs> Jerry Lee Lewis was just like a nutcase, right? From what oh, I yeah. understand, he's just like an absolute animal. Well, that's why he's called the killer, right? I mean, it was partly, but it was also because he was a showstopper, and, and I don't think anyone wanted to uh, wanted to go on stage after him. I think it was. I think that's probably where the killer came from. Well, I think is he it, set his piano on fire and said, "Here, follow that." I think is what he had done. Yeah, exa <laughs> exactly, exactly, exactly. You know, it, it, it'd be like it'd be like. Uh, you know, being the closing act after uh, after Jimi Hendrix, right? Or the Who, for that matter. Or the Who, for that matter. Yeah, those, those might be the two words. <laughs> yeah, but but just one of those where it's like, oh God, you know, right? So so uh, tell me, you were in bands. Um, what what's the biggest audience you played in front of? Um. Well, we did a showcase one time. We were we were with a production company. This is a band that I um um south it's the southeast Chicago Calumet City area. Uh, we had done a showcase that had about a thousand people in it. I think that was that's about the biggest that that comes to mind. Um, it was one of those deals where the production company comes to you and says. Okay, we've got this hall. It'll hold two thousand people. Here are the tickets. Go sell them. Except now, you have, we had to buy the tickets from them and then go sell the tickets. That was kind of how that that operated at the time, and we were just kind of like, "I'm not selling tickets." <laughs> and then come to find out, pretty much everyone else was not wanting to sell the tickets either. But it became a hassle. But, but I think about half the tickets got sold. And it was like a like a fifteen band showcase. It was kind of okay. like that. we all we all get our half hour that kind of thing. We played a cup. We played a couple of those actually, um, in Chicago in the Chicago area. And other than that, um, we you know played parties, small halls, you know the occasional gig here and there. But we focused more on practicing and songwriting. Okay, is that was kind of our that was kind of our vision was to hone the craft kind of first like we were talking about and then go try it out and then change what we didn't like go back try it out change what we didn't like and we were yeah. working on something that was going to be pretty good and then i moved to cincinnati <laughs> as is as is often the case with the with these right. kind of things but no it's good it, it's also you were lucky that you had the opportunity uh you know to to do that because I, I find that with myself, I, I really, I, I've always enjoyed all the different aspects of music because I, I was in a number of bands myself. Uh, and I love the practicing and the songwriting aspect and just like finally like seeing how the whole thing developed. 
right. um loved recording we were lucky enough to know someone who knew someone and you know we, there was a, an engineer who took pity was interested in us so we got we got to actually go into like a proper recording studio where actual albums were were made right one of the bigger ones in toronto actually uh and that was great because then you you have a demo tape that'll actually get you into clubs <laughs> you know, get you booked in clubs and then playing live which was always the the highlight right we we did end up getting some studio studio time out of it we had to have um we had to have songs that would go on the production releases you know they would put the production company would put together a disc with one song from every band on yeah. it and if he really liked you he'd put two songs on it because then then everyone knows who he's really trying to sell because those two tracks usually went first and yep. whoever just happened to sell that many tickets that <laughs> got, got one song put on the end or something like that but we we ended up getting put on one of those we kind of all looked at each other didn't like the deal that we were getting and we just kind of let that lapse and then uh we had a drummer that left we brought another drummer in changed the name of the band and went on doing what, what we were doing yeah you know, well, so what, what were the what were the band names okay the first one was doghouse volume okay which which i know that does it comes from a joke um how many pancakes can fill a doghouse you know the you know, okay now how many pancakes does it take to fill the doghouse when it's knocked over on its side and of course me being me i've got intricacies i'm like well it's the same number of pancakes well no no dude the answer is it doesn't matter no 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 it's the same number of pancakes the volume of the doghouse would not change no matter what position it's in and our drummer goes doghouse volume that's a great name for a band and both of the two uh, other two guys went well, no <laughs> <laughs> no no that sucks <laughs> and, but but no one had a better name so it but, stuck and that was the thing and jeff yeah. jeff contributed it and he was such a he's such a good guy it's like and he was so happy it's a great name okay fine we'll <laughs> we'll keep it there and then we ended up uh switching it to um the groove butchers and we were really into like humble pie and captain b fart the sensational yep. alex harvey band all of those kind of things so we were able just to do a whole lot of different things at that point so that's kind of why when you listen to my music um there are things that are similar from song to song to song but try try to really hammer me into a set genre i guess i'm rock but you'll hear like doo-wop stuff in there too just yeah. for just for kicks no oh, cool no it's it's fun um i'm just trying trying to think oh well before we forget sure uh, where where can where can people find you online and and stuff like that and i'll i'll be adding stuff down in the description as well okay um mostly on twitter um that that's where i have the biggest presence um yeah. i'm also on instagram i'm also on facebook yeah. um music wise youtube i'm there as well yeah and are you are you there as as brett newbold or as yeah. aging teen idol so it's all across the board brett newbold brett newbold across the board but if you look for aging teen idol if you do a search for aging teen idol i'll pop up and i think there's a band somewhere in illinois called the aging teen idols which is another reason why I really didn't want to jump into that one. But I think they're like a mom and pop band that does small clubs in Northern Illinois somewhere. But I I don't need to hide behind a moniker, but I think it's funny. <laughs> hey, it's, it, it's, it's part of the myth, right? No, well, I think part of the, myth, the, the whole myth making. It's more funny than anything because my, my buddy Mike, who's my trainer, goes, and here's Brent, the aging teen idol. <laughs> You know, it's it's kind of funny. So I, I just I leave it there. I think it's cool. Oh, it's good. It's good. And so, are you uh, you working on your next project now that uh, that this one's in the can? I have about six songs that are almost ready for me to start laying vocals on. So I'm really I'm either going to space them out as six singles, but I hate doing that. I really do. I like putting out suites of songs. I might put them out in groups of three, or I just might release it all at once, write six more songs and put out another 12 song album. Yeah. You know, I, I mean, I would recommend do the album, you know, and that's, that's probably the direction I'm going to go because it'll help me. It'll help me not focus on 
all of a sudden having four songs in a row that are completely different than one another. Not that not that there's any rules. There's not. But I kind of like those unified projects. That's kind of how my brain works. Mm-hmm. Well, and the, listen, the other thing that I, I think, uh, you know, I, I'm doing my first album. I mean, I've done the last thing I did was a six song EP. So I guess you'd call it an album. But right. it will be the first one that will have 10 or 11 tracks on it, like a proper 40 minute. 40 minutes of music. Cool. Um, and the thing is, I think that it does a few things. One is you can release six singles from it if you want, <laughs> you know, yeah. Uh, for, from the one record, you know, because you're just, you're promoting different songs, right. As you, you know, you try to get them on, right. on playlists and, and, you know, you're, promo you know, just do doing the sort of Twitter music thing. Um, but the other, the other thing is I think that it, it gives you a bit of a breathing space because the, the the problem that I found when I was doing singles is I was always sort of, you know what I mean? You, you get into this, this crazy sort of cycle where you, I have to release something. I got to release something, you know, I got to do something in two months. <laughs> well, it, exactly. Where, whereas yeah. this, you do the album and it's out and then you don't have to really release anything for a year if you don't want to. Well, that's it's, and that's, you can spend that year, year, and you can spend right. that year working on the next release, right? Okay. And that's that's how a lot of most everyone else does it. I mean, how many bands out there don't release another album for three years, four years? I mean, they, they yeah. do that now. Back in the '60s, they would release an album every three months. <laughs> they yeah. crazy. But most of what they were doing were songs that were written by other people too. I, I write a majority of my own stuff. Mm -hmm or I grabbed little bits and pieces from stuff that I had done previously, like riffs out of something that I, I know that I wrote that riff when I was in this band, it never went anywhere. So I'm, you know, recycling it. That happens a lot too. Yeah. No, no, cool. Excellent. And uh, are you going to be, are you going to be playing live at all? Are you, uh, you doing any of that? Mm. To, to promote I, really your want to. I really want to. I miss doing it. There's nothing quite like being being in front of a group of people to be able to make mistakes. You know, it's yeah. it's kind of like that. Um, I like I like having interact. As you can tell, I can talk about a whole lot of stuff for at length. You know, of course. <laughs> I can yeah. do, but that's kind of how it is when I when I'm playing live. If someone, you know, because I open up. I'm a teacher. I open, yep. Ask a question. Okay, here's the answer. Now here's a song. Here's the answer. Here's the song. You know, but I like. I like having the opportunity to hone my craft in front of people because it, it, there's an honesty to it. You know? Yeah, I know. Well, I mean, have you, I would say that if any of your songs really, well, actually the, the new one, the, uh, the kink song, I think would transfer very well uh, onto an acoustic guitar because it's just, you know, Oh yeah, that's an, an acoustic know. guitar with steel strings, I think could you probably get a really good, you know, very violent femme sound out of it that would probably work work quite well. Uh, but 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 doing doing one of these, you know, one of these song circles or at least something like that, because because obviously, like with me, the big problem is, is I don't have a band. And the idea of playing with like backing tracks with me, you know, lip syncing the vocals or something is a little defeats the purpose. Right. Well, that's kind of why I cringed. I was like, yeah, eh, then I have to teach these guys my songs, which, you know, yeah. isn't, which isn't a bad thing. Again, it'd be like, okay, you're doing this. Okay. You're doing this. And okay. You're doing this. And then all of a sudden I'm back 20 years ago. I was like, what you just did wasn't right. And then it goes back to my aunt. <laughs> I became yeah, my aunt. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> the key was G. <laughs> you know, it's not you're, a B. You're singing the song and you're calling out the change. You're like da 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 G da 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 da, da B da da da. You know, you, know you, you turn into a cheerleader as you're going like yeah. Drum fill. All right, here we go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. But no, but or the, the or the drummer who can't keep the beat. You know, but if I if I were gonna play live, it would be probably just me and acoustic, me and an acoustic. Um, cause again, I don't really like doing backing tracks. I mean, a lot yeah. of my songs can transfer over. Yeah. There's, there's overdubs here and there, but I, I approach the recording process as if I were going to play this instrument all the way through live. Yeah. 
you know, and that, that's kind of the way that I do that. Um, so a lot of my songs, if I, if I can't do it in one sitting to sing and play, just playing the basic cowboy chords, then chances are I'm not going to do it live. Yeah. So, but well, yeah, it's, not it's, it's together, something to throw out there. Yeah. If I, if I could get a band together and we had uh, a unified vision, unified vision, I, I would be more than happy to do it because, you know, and if I had to pay to get a band together, I guess I would, I wouldn't like it, but because I, that, that to me, then you're just turning this group of musicians into hired hands. And then to me, that's not really honest because a band to me are three or four good friends getting together and jamming, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And that, that's, that's what I enjoy most about being in a band. Yeah. No, 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 def definitely. For, for me, it was, it was definitely the, the, um, the friendships you form, it becomes real, a, a real band of brothers, right? Right. You know, and, M and mostly, really mostly because of all the crazy experiences you go through. Well, that, I mean, and even if it ends badly and you end up really not liking one another, you still yeah. have each other's back, even from a distance if something really bad happened. I mean, yeah. um, even if you're hesitant to call, <laughs> you know, you know, my number hasn't changed. I'm still here just in case, you know. So that's kind of cool. No, good stuff. Anyway, Brett, thank you so much for your time. No problem. It was a real pleasure and uh, good good luck with the recording. You. Uh, you know, going going well and uh, hopefully it gets it get it gets a good reception from your I saw you you've actually built up a nice audience on uh, Spotify, I have to say. Yeah, um I, I do I do I try to not overdo the self promotion because I actually want to be Brent Newbold on Twitter as well, not yeah. just Brent Newbold Aging Teen Idol. So I try to be as genuinely as I possibly can. I leave a lot of personal stuff out of it, of course, yeah. but I try to be as genuine a human being as I possibly can. Well, that's good. You know, and that's a that's a good uh, good philosophy to live by. Right, and you know, they go, "Oh, you do music? Yeah, sure. Here it is. Go listen." And they'll go listen and they'll heart it. Really, you do music? Yeah. Before we go, yeah, the, thing, the kids at my school actually, you know, that's one of the things that I really don't do. I don't walk in going, "Hello, I'm Mr. Newbold. You can see me on Spotify. You can see me on YouTube." I'm not that guy either. But one of the students, I guess, searched me up on. I guess they were searching the teachers, and my music popped up. Yeah, there's a knock on my door. Mr. Newbold. Yeah. You never told us you were famous. <laughs> I was like, well, I'm not really famous, but if you want to think I am, then by all means, kid, <laughs> I'll be famous. Well, listen, you're you're famous in all the right places. Right. And that's and right. That's, and that's that's a pretty cool feeling though, just out of nowhere when you didn't solicit it. Yeah. Saw your music and we really liked it. Well, thank you. <laughs> you know, so that that's organic growth. So, yeah, no, 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 to totally. And I mean, it's it's also something that uh, that I it's the same with me. I mean, I don't go out and I'm not, you know, bumping into people for the first time. And oh, it's like, you know, you know, it's like uh, subscribe to my Spotify channel you know, right. or, or whatever. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it is fun. It is fun when people sort of discover it and it's like, oh, interesting. You know, I'll check it out. See, that's but anyway. Cool. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, no, I, I was just going to say thank you again for your time and uh, good luck with the release. And uh, we'll stay in touch. Yes. And uh, it was a, a real pleasure sort of putting uh, a name, well, a face to the name and a voice to the to the sort of uh, Twitter discussions that we've had. Right. right. Anyway. Yeah. And uh, thank you for having me on. It, it's an honor. And maybe... Oh. Uh, Maybe coming up this Christmas, we can do another Yuletide Runners thing. <laughs> that would be a load of fun. I was, I actually, I, I stumbled across it and was, uh, was listening to it again. That worked out quite well. I was cracking up. I actually was going. I, I think Angie is the one that that wanted to do that originally, and it was yeah. like, it was like you, me, G, uh, John, and um, I think a couple of other people. But yeah, that, what do you want for two days worth of work? How am yeah. I sending this to you? Okay, here you go. <laughs> but no, yeah. the, one, the one mistake I made was agreeing to do the production. I think I, I did the most work. 
Well, yeah, I, I think that's I think that's really. But yeah, you crank after you got everything, you cranked it out in two day, four day total worth of work. Yeah, that. that hey, well, it's phenomenal. isotope, isotope, the vis visual mixer. I mean, it's so easy. It's yeah, so easy yeah. to do a quick mix with that thing. That's awesome. I, I don't know about you, but for me, it's like it was like a revelation when I started using that. Yep, I'm about to jump on that. Anyway, <laughs> talk to you soon. Thank you so much. Oh, my pleasure.